Here are your AARP top tips on shortcuts to happiness. Research has found that people over 50 often get happier as they age. Along with proper sleep and diet, here are some more ways to boost your bliss, according to the experts. See the morning light. Sunlight boosts serotonin, a chemical your body produces to regulate mood and improve your ability to focus. Try taking a morning walk to absorb some sun. That early dose of daylight also helps you get better sleep at night. Get in micro-exercise. If you can't do a regular workout each day, at least take a short walk, even if it's just for five minutes. Or you can lift hand weights or do balance exercises. Even a small amount of exercise can help reduce stress. Tidy up. A little decluttering each day can also lighten your mood and ease your mind. Getting organized could lead to better sleep, improved relationships, and even weight loss. Reach out. See friends or visit family. Reconnect with old pals. If a good friend is far away, set an annual time and place to meet, or join a group and make new friends. Meditate. Just five minutes a day of quiet reflection can do wonders to relieve anxiety, neutralize negative thinking, and clear your mind. If you don't know how to get started, there's plenty of guidance available in books, classes, and apps. For more tips to stay healthy, visit aarp.org health. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Good evening. I want to welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. I am so happy you can be here with us. Um, in case you couldn't tell by that little shot of a, a vintage film that actually is from 8mm um, silent film that I found years ago at an estate sale. Um, and in case you can't tell my background, we're going to have so much fun as we're going to talk about Fountain Hills. And so, you know, I want to say welcome to all of you here. You know, we are going to have a great time on this May 20th. You know, one of the things I love is the fact that we have so many folks who are watching us on Facebook, YouTube, and, you know, even Twitch gets a few more viewers each time, which is kind of exciting. Since I'm not the target demographic for Twitch at all. So... So, you know, so today in Arizona history, so on this day back in 1901, Arizona Chinese residents faced much discrimination. Despite the many contributions they to the development of a territory, then onto the state, back in 1901, law prohibited Chinese from marrying Anglos, stating that a marriage of a person of Caucasian blood with a Negro or Mongolian is null and void. And so all those men that came over from China and other places to lay train tracks, to get us where we are today, I am so glad that we have moved forward and that now that is not a thing. So it is also National Red Shoe Day. So hopefully you're wearing your red shoes. That is in honor of 
Awareness of Food Allergies. It is also National Rescue Dog Day. And I have to say, I love that I've seen so many friends posting their dogs on social media. Um, actually, one friend did even a before, kind of just as she got her dog. And now the dog and the difference between the two, you would almost think it was two different animals. Now, it is also National Quiche Lorraine Day. Whenever I think of Quiche Lorraine, I immediately think of the B-52s and a poodle named Quiche Lorraine. It is also National Streaming Day. So we are streaming here, and I'm so happy you're joining our live stream. Now, what can you expect tonight? Well, we have our trivia. We have some show and tell. We have some Arizona music history. We have a beverage as well as little Arizona. And oh, do we have a guest for you tonight? Just hold on to your pants. You're going to have so much fun. You're going to learn something um, that was, you know, you think you know something and then you realize you really don't. And so that's the fun of this show. So if this is your first time here, you might wonder, who is that man? Why is he on my screen? Well, you know, my name is Marshall Shore. I've been here a little over 21 years. Before that, I was working in a library in Brooklyn. Actually, it was this beautiful Carnegie building. And there's what it looked like on the inside. But even though it was all that warm wood on the inside, outside on the winter, it was not warm. It was chilly. It was cold. It was, there was wind blowing all kinds of places and I had had enough of it. So I decided to trade that off for a concrete block building built in the 1950s for Phoenix Public Library in South Phoenix. And as soon as I got here, there was this rich oral tradition of the community and how did it evolve to where it was. And so I realized a lot of folks weren't really looking at kind of that modern history. And I'm happy to say now, Harmon has a beautiful modern facility with lots of windows and lots of community folks using it. Now to do that, I had to load everything we own into a big orange cube, a U-Haul, and you know, their world headquarters are right here in the Valley of the Sun. Now, when we got here, we promptly moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch. Now, when we moved in, it was oh so many tones of beige inside and out. I am happy to say now on the outside, it is just two-tone, seafoam and cantaloupe. There's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile. The house really is a time capsule. That was kind of the fun of it, is really being able to take a step back in time and take a look at it in a completely different way. And, you know, as soon as I got here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history here. But every time I went somewhere, whether it was on foot, in my car, on a bike, I kept running into so many amazing people, places, and stories. And so that's what really kind of got me doing exactly what I'm doing, being the hip historian. Now, there's also post-war boom, all those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on the way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers. And in some cases, looking for a house just like mine. And as the hip historian, I get a play with Arizona history. I mean, why just alone this week, I got to do a tour of Scottsdale's Museum of the West, where I'm actually trying to get them to be a guest on a future episode. So look forward to that. You know, I'm always, every time I go to this museum, I'm always amazed by the exhibits, the thought they put into them. So if you haven't been, I highly suggest you go. And hopefully we'll get Wade on here to talk about some of the reasons why you should go and see some of those amazing things in their collection. And I think one of the coolest things is soon after they opened, they were invited by the Smithsonian to be a part of all those Smithsonian museums. So right here in the Valley of the Sun, we have a Smithsonian museum. And you know, what's really cool is so this week, I was supposed to actually do a pilot for a TV show. We were going to be out in Scottsdale filming at the Sugar Bowl. 
And like an hour before I was going to walk out the door, they called and said, we ran into some fires we've got to put out. So we're going to have to reschedule. So I'm looking forward to getting a chance to reschedule with them as well as working up on a podcast for a friend who's going to be doing, it's going to be a national thing. And so she was looking for somebody to kind of talk about some Arizona history. So who did she pick? The hip historian. Indeed. And oh my gosh, you know, you never know when you work on a project. I worked on a project with ASU Cronkite um, and they did a little um, newsreel um, on a story out at Greenwood Cemetery. And I just found out that we are going to be included in the first vote for an Emmy. So we may make it to actually getting a name published on a screen. Who knows? I haven't bought a new suit yet, but that doesn't mean I'm not looking. And then also later this month at the Care Cultural Center, we are doing a storytelling series. Um, this one, they do gather and we are going to be doing it on Fast Friends. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And there'll be other storytellers as well. Um, this one will be virtual. We'll actually be at the Care Cultural Center, but you can all watch. I'll be sure and post the link as soon as I get those. And that brings up a point. How do you know where those links are? Well, you know, you can find them on Facebook. I'll push them out on Instagram as well. You can also, if you have a question, you can always throw something off to me at hello at Hip Historian via email. So if you're watching on Facebook, there is a little button that says share. And I would really appreciate it if you did indeed share. So that way you can see how much fun we're having. And all your friends will know too. So let's talk a little bit, little Arizona. So I mentioned I was from New York, but I actually grew up in a little tiny town in the Midwest, in Indiana. I mean, it was surrounded by cornfields or bean fields, depending on the time of year. Actually, not time of year, but it was actually the year because they would do this rotation. And so actually my first job was out there weeding beans with this little long pole and a hook on the end with a, like, was like a razor so you could cut all the weeds down. And so I'm also working on a book called Little Arizona because, you know, I kind of have an affinity for some of those small towns that can be quite quirky in their own way. And so that's the fun of getting to explore not only Arizona with the fifth largest city in the country, as well as so many small towns with a rich and varied history. And today we're going to talk about Jake's Corner, which is about 20 miles south of Prescott. It was originally called Felton and was a stage stop on the way from um, people coming from Globe to Prescott. And so it was originally on the homestead of Annie Hart. Now, originally it was kind of a waylay. So when the Salt River would flood, people would hang out there until the waters went down and the stagecoaches could go across the water again. Um, Jake's Corner then became, it acquired that name later on. There was a man who opened up the first store his name was George, him and his wife, Virginia. She had, they had a, a vegetable stand and it was basically, you know, toss in your money, take your vegetables and they would come pick up the money daily. So then he decided to build a store, but you know, he wasn't around much. He was a Bronco rider. And so he was off on all these world-class adventures with his friend, Charlie Meadows, who's better known as Arizona Charlie, who is actually the father of the Payson Rodeo the oldest rodeo st still operating. And you know, George Felton said that there was no horse he couldn't ride. There was always a standing bet with George that he had a thousand dollars he would put that he could ride any horse. But what he would do is he would actually put silver dollars on the stirrups. And when he was done riding the horse, those silver dollars would still be there. Now you can go visit Jake's Corner and you might have seen some of, there was a movie called Jake's Corner that they actually filmed in three weeks at Jake's Corner. And in the movie, they said it's a popular stop for travelers headed that 
it was one of those places in the desert that was a rest stop for travelers making their way through the Arizona desert. But for people who live there, it's a rest stop for life. And so that movie was done in 2008. It is still a popular place for people to go when they are traveling either to the Rim, Rim Country, Roosevelt Lake, or even Tonto Basin area, or even just locals. And indeed, there are almost 200 people that are local to Jake's Corner. Now, of course, it wouldn't be happy hour without a cocktail or a beverage. And I'm so excited because, you know, PBJ always surprises me um sometimes he likes to challenge me with what's he gonna make and so today since we were talking about fountain hills we were actually talking about bone house brewing and they have miner's debt black ipa and so this time i don't get to mix anything i don't have to shake anything make it frothy all i have to do is pull the tab and pour Oh, and I'm not a very good pourer because look at all that foam. All right. Well, we're going to let that sit a moment. But you can see, look how dark and beautiful that color is at the bottom. Yeah, don't mind all the foam. The, yeah, just, just ignore that. It's You don't need to see that. All right. We're going to actually take that so you, that way you don't have to see the foam. And you can watch me take a sip of it in just a little bit. So now, one of the things I love is that PJ is always going on adventures, and I think we may actually do a little meetup at Bone House. Because look at that interior. I mean, all those skulls. I mean, oh my gosh. They have been in business since 2018 when they brewed their first beer. And... They now have gone on. They have a whole slew of beers. Actually, I've got another one in the fridge that's a different type, so that way I can try that. But I do look forward to just getting up and exploring and finding such a, a beautiful, funky-looking bar. So that's going to be a lot of fun as we go on that adventure. I might even let people know when we're doing that, so maybe people could tag along if they wanted to. Now, through the miracle of modern technology, oh, just wait. You know, you saw the movie clip. You see my background. So I want to bring on my friend, Jenny. Nope. And let's, there you go. There you go. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I uh, really appreciate it. I've been watching your shows and uh, really enjoying them, learning about you. You learn about us, we learn about you. Exactly. That's the fun is everybody gets to share stories. Yes, wonderful. Um, so if you're doing your book, if, you, if you're if you not done with it yet, you might end up being intrigued by Fountain Hills and wanting to add a few things into your book. In, indeed. <laughs> um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about myself and a little overview of Fountain Hills before we get to the... Uh, the questions and all the, the trick questions that I hope I can uh, get everybody really intrigued with. Shh, um, we don't tell people it's trick questions. <laughs> trick answers? So, <laughs> it's fun. That's the goal is that it's absolutely. fun. Absolutely. Well, so you uh, mentioned Brooklyn. So I spent a little bit of time there myself. I was actually born in uh, upstate New York in, Bro in the Mohawk Valley. Um, and between that and living in the Hudson Valley, uh, I lived in Brooklyn. So uh, we have that in common. Um, and my dad and my mom were both uh, from Brooklyn and they actually met on a subway. So that was kind of neat. So I did grow up in, uh, in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, I went to college at Tufts University in Boston. I got a math degree there. Uh, later, I moved to uh, Vermont in another valley in New Hampshire. So I kind of uh, sticking with that, uh, that theme. My parents came out here in uh, the seventies for a trip. They stayed at Cowellback Mountain uh, and, and the, the inn there. And I think I can say that that changed the course of history of our family. Uh, we have five kids in our family and uh, maybe even say that it changed the course of history in Fountain Hills. And I'll be telling you a little bit about what my family did there. 
Uh, they fell in love with this desert community, which you can imagine in uh, 79 was uh, quite a bit different than it is now. Uh, my dad was an uh, orthopedic surgeon and he started the orthopedic uh, residency program at the VA hospital. And as you can see with the picture, my mom was a violinist. She played with the Hudson Valley Philharmonic. And then when we moved here, she was with Scottsdale Symphony. Um, we, the five of us followed them to Arizona one by one. Uh, my brother, who's also a physician, uh, orthopedic doctor, uh, they ended up settling in Paradise Valley, but most, but the rest of us followed them here. They thought they were getting away from us. <laughs> but I had to say on our, some of our initial visits, it was, you know, I'd never been anywhere like Arizona and I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> oh, you said right? a mouthful right there. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, so we would visit them and uh, I think the first time maybe was in 80 or 81. Um, your uh, black IPA picture makes me think of some of the things we conjured up, you know, the, uh, the skulls and the superstition mountains and the lost oh, Dutchman yeah, and right. yeah. who's out there and, you know, go, being in, in the backyard of their house and hearing coyotes, it was all very, uh, very interesting and neat for us. Um, and about, I just want to mention the bone house too. If you go, um, they often have live entertainment and we have a, a woman here named Amy Burnett, who was with game and fish and she'll do these really neat, uh, presentations about scorpions and what have you. And, uh, they also have food trucks. So, um, if you are going to come, let me know and I'll meet you down there. Oh, that would sure. be so much fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you're right about the way it looks too. It's very, very cool. Um, I raised three sons here in Fountain Hills. They all went through K-12 Fountain Hills School District. Um, I was just uh, there yesterday doing a presentation about something else. And I was, it was kind of neat. Of course, they're all grown now. But to say that I have three sons that grew up in Fountain Hills, um, one is a uh, Wharton PhD in teaching in Syracuse University. Uh, one is a fire captain. He went to U of A in um, Scottsdale. And then the other is a thrash metal guitar player and a chef <laughs> in <laughs> Philly. So uh, we're not a homogenous community by any sense of the word. And uh, I'm actually, he's going to come visit next week, and I'm going to bring him to Bone House because uh, – that uh, decor is exactly right for his. Uh, I was saying, it sounds like it'd be right up his alley. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. So I like to say I was a math major. I did some uh, bookkeeping and other related fields, um, but eventually kind of got into the public policy aspect of it. I worked at the Arizona State Senate for a while, and I worked at the Department of Environmental Quality, which you might know is right across the street from the Carnegie Library here, just this amazing historic building um, and right uh, down your, up your alley, I guess I'd say. Yes, and, um, and he just on street from the Capitol. Yeah, so what So what did you say you did at the Carnegie Library? Well, actually I, I didn't, work, so I was at a Carnegie Library back in New York. Yes. And so I actually was the manager there and then um, decided it was time for a change. So then I came to work for Phoenix Public doing the same thing in South Phoenix. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's really great. I, I thought that's what you said, that you actually worked there in New York. Um, so while I was working and raising kids, I, I had run and was served on the Fountain Hills Unified School District Board. Um, one, one of our principals for the high school is uh, Dr. Paisley. And while I was working at DEQ, a young woman came into work her name was Kelly Paisley. And I was like, uh, and that's who introduced me to you. So and I wanted to make sure indeed, I gave her yes. a shout out because she walked into DEQ and we made the connection right away. Um, so the school board stuff kind of led to more and more involvement. Uh, I was on the city council, town council here for eight years. And now I've been mayor since 2018. Just a little bit about Fountain Hills. Um, you point out where it is. It's we're really close to uh you know, Payson and, and all of the, the mountain area, but we're also really right in the middle of it with the metropolitan area, you, you know, the airports and uh, Phoenix, of course, Scottsdale and uh, all the sports that we, my husband and I love to go to uh, watch the games here. So it's kind of like out in the middle of a, of a beautiful area, but close to everything we would ever want to do. We have a lot of outdoor life, um, health, uh, wellness sort of, uh, brand. Um, we just put in a new hospital. We have beautiful trails, urban trails and uh, trails through the uh, McDowell Mountain Preserve. We have disc golf and 
and all kinds of uh, recreational activities, pickleball, 5Ks. Um, I know you had some pictures because uh, when you live in Fountain Hills, you certainly live among the wildlife. We have uh, owls and roadrunners and bobcats. Uh, we have our uh, javelinas that, as you can see, come right up to our door. <laughs> right. <laughs> so don't put your pumpkin out on Halloween because you know what, what's going to end up happening to that. Oh, my gosh. I never thought of that. Oh, yeah. They, they love that. And um, our, that that uh, bald eagle, which took up uh, residence in, uh, or at least a regular visitor at, down at the fountain, and um, and of course uh, we've had they're not native here, but we've had some black bears that were kind of lost their way, and that's an older picture of one that had to uh, a baby that had to be rescued. Um, so then I just want to mention too that while we're in this area, we're also on the lookout for wildfires. But um, we actually are pretty lucky that most of the time, the direction that they're going is not towards town, Rio Verde or Ross or Scottsdale. Uh, we did have one once, and I know I think I added a photo in there somewhere, but uh, that was in 1995, and it was called the Rio Fire. The Rio Fire. Um, I was going to read this from the Times, said that uh, in uh, July of 1995, few who lived in Fountain Hills or Rio Verde at the time will ever forget watching and waiting for a possible order to evacuate, or could we stay put? Seeing those flames like that against the night sky would mean no sleep for many of us. When you look back though, it was 23,000 acres. Um, probably some of the things we've seen now uh, that's dwarfed by them. Um, there were no injuries, no loss of buildings. And um, I was talking to our fire uh, chief the other day. And um, one fact that's kind of interesting uh, was that the fire was pushed hard by wind, which caused it to move quickly and didn't kill the root, sur uh, the root systems. So we saw life coming back, except for the saguaro, uh, rather quickly. So that's that was uh, a fortunate, fortunate thing. Um, we have all manner of service clubs here, churches. We're right by Fort McDowell, uh, Yavapai Nation, and uh, Salt River Pima Indian Community. We have a vibrant parks and rec department that right now is up for a national gold medal award. They've been chosen as one of four in the nation. So even so far, that's a pretty amazing thing for a small town like us. We say we're small but mighty. We have uh, restaurants, live theater, uh, all kinds of amenities, and uh, obviously our beautiful hometown desert, uh, desert environment. I want to say that to give credit as we look, move forward to give uh, some of it is from memory, but I also have this book called Rising Above the Rest, which was um, written by uh, kind of a lot of people, but it was put together by Alan Cruikshank, uh, Jerry Miles and Jean Linzer, longtime residents and leaders in the community. And I also uh, use the Times of Fountain Hills and some other things as reference as we go forward. And again, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to showcase Fountain Hills. Oh, indeed. And so how did you guys, what did you do during COVID? Oh, yeah. Well, COVID was, um, you know, we, we, we do have a little bit of an older population. So I guess I'll start with the vaccine, which is the newest thing. And uh, we end up having uh, quite a few of our folks 65 and over, or probably over 90% now have been vaccinated. But yeah, those all of those ribbon cuttings and things you see here on the picture uh, came to a screeching halt. I'll talk a little bit about some of the things we were planning to do for our 50th anniversary that had to be altered or postponed. Um, we did have testing that you see me there, uh, which was kind of hard to come by. Now it's pretty easy, but in the beginning it was hard. So we partnered mm -hmm. with the county and with Embry Health and the state of Arizona. And then obviously getting sworn in with our masks on is sort of a, a stark reality of what we were living through there. Very much so. Yeah. As we're now coming out on the other end of that. Yes. Very, very happy to see that happening. People being able to go out to dinner and have and have uh, enjoy their families and such. So, yes. All right. Well, as people know who've seen us, but have watched before, we always do trivia. It's <laughs> always multiple choice. Sometimes it's not an easy choice. But, you know, if you don't know the answer, all you got to do is guess because one of them is the correct answer. And so you can keep tabs of your answer. Some folks do it in the chat. Some folks do it 
on a pad and paper. You can do it however you feel comfortable, however you want to do it. So as we get ready for some trivia, so our first question. Oh, and first I'll have to, I have to, let, wait a minute, let me go back to a big, big screen. So this is pretty darn tasty. Is it? Oh, yeah. Good. I don't know what to look for. So yeah, it's, what, it's a very. It's what a very, is your other selection? Um, you know, I don't know. Remember? <laughs> so well, you know, you'll like, DJ said you'll like this. So I was Great. like, sweet. So Thank yeah. You. <laughs> All right. So our first question is: How did Fountain Hills come to be? A. Scottsdale was looking to expand and annex the land. B, JFK made a nationwide call for more cities. C, seasonal flooding caused the need for a lake. D, all of the above. E, none of the above. You know, it's so funny. This reminds me so much in college. I had a <laughs> biology professor. And so every test always had those two options at the bottom. So... It was always, you had to be very careful with your answers. <laughs> That's so. funny. I had a Spanish teacher once that would read the answers like you did, but I, he probably just couldn't help himself, but he'd be like, you know, ah, be, se, be. <laughs> like, oh, well, that is. <laughs> <laughs> right, giving, giving, giving the answers away. <laughs> so funny. All right, so question two. How does Fountain Hills celebrate St. Patty's Day? A, all the bars and breweries donate 10% of the proceeds from their green beer sales to charity. Or is it B, the town dyes the fountain green at noon on March 17th? C, a dancing contest is held to a trip for Ireland. And, of course, it is going to be D, all of the above, or E, none of the above. So while you're trying to figure out how does Fountain Hills celebrate St. Patrick's Day, we're going to move on to question three. Speaking of holidays, how does the community celebrate Thanksgiving? A, with a Thanksgiving Day Parade. B, a 5K run. C, food drives. And D, all of the above. Or E, all of, none of the above. So, <laughs> all right. We well, were trying to figure out if you can go to the parade, run the race, and also deliver some food. We're going to move on to question through four. Besides excellent schools, what is special about Fountain Hills Unified School District? A, they were the only AZ school board with sitting Native American members. B, the board included a teacher turned member. C, the board included a student turned a member. Or C, all of the above. Or D, none of the above. So which do you think is what what do you think is unique about the Fountain Hills Unified School District? All right, moving on to number 5. Which of these national chain fast food restaurants is not See I was putting that emphasis like your Spanish teacher did not <laughs> associate with Fountain Hills. A White Castle B, McDonald's, C, Burger King, D, Subway, E, all of the above, or F, none of the above. Which one of those national food chains is not associated with Fountain Hills? Now, now is not a good time to run out for food from <laughs> any one of those. We're still in the middle of trivia. So, class, pay attention. <laughs> all right. Question six, Fountain Hills is an arts and cultural center. Which of these exist? A, live theater. B, docent-led art walks. C, a museum. 
D, a library. E, all of the above. Or F, none of the above. So what do you think makes Fountain Hills an arts and cultural center? All right, moving on down to question seven. The base of the fountain is fashioned as A, a lily. B, a barrel cactus. C, a chalice. D, a tulip. Or E, none of the above. I like how we left out all of the above because it couldn't be <laughs> all of them kind of mashed together. That would not be very attractive. But All right. So question eight, which of the following is a sister city to Fountain Hills? Lucerne, Switzerland, Deerdorf, Germany, Carmore, Alberta, Canada, or is it all of the above or is it none of the above? And I bet the answer is going to shock people. <laughs> All right. Well, you're trying to figure that out. We're going to go on to question nine. How did Fountain Hills celebrate Arizona's centennial? A, the community submitted a state-sanctioned project. B, a large birthday cake was baked celebrating that February 14th of 2012. C, Centennial Circle, a permanent amenity in the Civic Plaza was created. Or D, all of the above, or E, none of the above. All right. So how did Fountain Hills celebrate Centennial? And our last question has to do with something that I found really interesting. Fountain Hills is a 17th international dark sky community. This means A, street lights are not permitted. B, trees and buildings cannot be more than 50 feet tall. C, outdoor lights turned off after 10 p.m., including the fountain. Or D, all of the above. Or E, none of the above. All right. Well, while you're getting your answers together, we're going to take a little bit of a Arizona music break. And so we are going to talk about a local group right here in the valley called Rock Lobster. Now, they are a cover band covering the 80s and 90s, all those songs we all know and love so much. And I've actually seen them playing at a few venues around town. They've kind of come out with a bang. I mean, I see they're doing lots of things, but they were most recent. They were recently back in early April. They were at the Fountain Hills Music Festival along with four other brands, as well as our friends from <laughs> Bone House <laughs> with food trucks, serving up some of their tasty brew. And it looked like a lot of fun. So next year, put that on your calendar and make your way out to Fountain Hills and go enjoy all kinds of music, as well as some great local brewed beer <laughs> all right so now we're ready for some answers oh my gosh you know and and i you know i found this one kind of really fascinating as well i mean question one so how did fountain hills come to be <laughs> b jfk made a nationwide call for more cities <laughs> i feel like that should be more of a question mark than a period no kidding I figured that one would really throw everybody off because it really wouldn't come to mind. And it sounds kind of, uh, you know, off to say that, but um, just a little history of the, of our town industrialist, Robert McCullough, who became known for building motors. You know, you've heard of that chainsaws, oh, yeah. McCullough oil. So in the early sixties, he was looking for a place to test out his outboard motors. So he learned about Lake Havasu and decided that he was going to build a facility there. And then he dreamed of creating a town to relocate his manufacturing operations there. And um, apparently he wanted to escape the LA congestion. So he found building, building a city was challenging. And so he brought on one of his colleagues, uh, C.V. Wood, who had been the original planning director for Disneyland. This kind of all comes together, right? And he hired another Disney executive named Frederick Schumacher as project manager. 
So along with Lauren Pratt, who worked at MCO Sales, things started to take off. And a few years later, in 1968, they had purchased London Bridge, rebuilding it in Lake Havasu City and gaining international fame. So now to about Fountain Hills, right? In 1963, President John Kennedy, with the nation's population increasing at a very rapid rate, which will uh, leave it to us baby boomers, I apparently was the cause, called, he called for the creation of 100 new cities of 100,000 population. So with the success of Lake Havasu City and to answer JFK's call, C.V. Wood and McCullough entered the new city development business. They acquired the P-Bar Ranch, a working cattle ranch northeast, northeast of Phoenix. They named it Chaparral City. They were stymied at first, which I found interesting, um, by objections to the needed legislation for a special municipal district by Scottsdale and also by the League of Arizona Cities and Towns. They moved on to other ventures because of that um, until the path was clear to create a community without legislation. So in 1969, ground was broken and what was now to be called Fountain Hills. We can talk about that a little bit later. Um, MCO is the current, current name of the McCull of the uh, developer. So the community is considered to have started in 1970, but incorporation wouldn't happen until 1989, with the third term time being a charm with that. The man who was to become our first mayor, John Catello, and others' first attempt in 1985 failed, has to be voted on. Then after that, the city of Scottsdale stated publicly that they would not allow another incorporation election. Um, after a while, with a lot of conversation, as you can imagine, they relented, but in 1988, the voters again did not favor incorporation. Finally, with more unity, a lot of hard work, knocking on doors, Fountain Hills residents decide to control our fate, incorporate. I remember that. My brother-in-law is in that committee. So now we're 25,000 strong. We're celebrating 35 years. We did celebrate 35 years as a municipality and 50 as a community. So there wow. you go. <laughs> I didn't realize it had a connection to Kamakola and the whole Disney thing and everything else. That's pretty fascinating. It makes sense when you think, and especially with the London Bridge part of it, right? Yeah, no, that they want, they needed something that would be really spectacular. Yeah, and draw. so, and that kind of brings us to the very next question: How does Fountain Hill celebrate St. Patrick's Day? And it is B: The town dyes the fountain green at noon on March seventeenth. We sure do. The tradition of turning the fountain green began when a young cowboy named Terry Gill moved here from Montana. He rode his horse into a local establishment, the Silver Stein, on St. Patrick's Day in 1978. Rode the horse there. Later, he was asked, hey, what are you going to do for an encore? And he said, let's turn the fountain green. So he challenged those in the bar with him to join him water skiing around the fountain as it turned green or that they would lose a bet and no doubt some pride. So they all showed up. They did the deed. <laughs> and the Fountain Hill Shamrock Society was formed. Many of our locals will remember and recognize some of those names along with Terry Gills, like Dawson, Lavoie, Nelson, Apps, Travis, and Archambeau. They also created Nessie, that was that little green picture you just saw, the Fountain Ness Monster. So, uh, oh, I was wondering what it was like, gonna be called. What the heck called. was that, right? Oh my God. It was a pontoon boat, um, and Nessie was a popular attraction. Over the years, they added crazy things. They painted green shamrocks and Nessie footprints all over on streets and buildings. Um, you can imagine that didn't last that long. <laughs> there are no more shamrock society, no more Nessie, no more green paint, and definitely no water skiing. But the memories and the tradition uh, of the green fountains certainly live on. Um, we did turn the fountain green this year. We didn't do it last year. But as we started to emerge from COVID, we uh, turned it on. And in the evening, uh, one, of, uh, one of the things we did was spiff up the lights around uh, the fountain. And we had new LED multicolor lights, but we used uh, green, of course, on, uh, on St. Patrick's Day uh, after dark. 
And we oh, expect so you next didn't have to actually dye the water green this year. We did. No, we did it. Oh, we you actually did it. Well, as the light. It must have been dye. really beautiful with the lights and the green water. Yes. Yeah, so we usually just do it at on noon at noon, but we did it twice because we had the extra from last year. <laughs> and uh, so we did it at five also. And then after dark, we did the lights. And next year, is it will be back in full swing, which is not just turning the fountain green, but we have um, music and food and, of course, green beer. So we're hope to see everybody uh, come next next year, March 17th. All kinds of fun. <laughs> you bet. All right. Speaking of holidays, how does the community celebrate Thanksgiving? Well, the answer is all of the above with a parade, <laughs> a 5K run, and food drives. It is for sure. We start the day early on uh, with our turkey trot and fun run um, through our community services department. Uh, we have our goofy looking turkey mascot. We have t-shirts and bibs that are distributed to the runners and walkers of all ages and abilities, burning off those calories in anticipation of uh, what's to come later in the day. Uh, on a more sober note, for those who don't have a problem of too many calories, as in many communities, the people of Fountain Hills donate turkeys and fixings through the Extended Hands Food Bank, our local local grocery stores, organizations, and churches. The parade itself was the mission of new resident E.J. Goodwin, who uh, was an early resident coming from Detroit, and she was disappointed to see that there was no Thanksgiving parade here. In fact, she would find out that there was no city or town west of the Mississippi had a parade. So she persisted, um, I thought this was interesting, against some who felt it would interfere with family time, but she did it and she created the Parada de los Cerros, which means uh, Parade in the Hills. And that was in 1984. Uh, Fountain Hills pioneer and editor of the Times newspaper, Alan Cruikshank, who I mentioned earlier as one of the authors of the book, was the first parade marshal and the grand marshal was Ladmo. <laughs> Well, the longest continuous running TV show in the country at the time, the Wallace and Ladmo show. There were bands and prizes and uh, for the uh, initial parade, probably about 50 entries. Um, we look forward, we obviously didn't do it this year, uh, to resuming this wonderful event, which not surprisingly has become a family tradition. And the one picture that you have there was the Fountain Hills Theater. Um, what they've done is uh, put, they, they'll, so they have the character, the costumes and all from whatever play they happen to be doing. And that was a uh, little Abner at the time. And uh, my sisters and I are in that and our kids uh, are 40 year old kids at about, you know, age eight or so. And then um, we had the Fountain Hills at 50 uh, car. So we were lucky, you know, cause we got that in before everything happened. And then the other one there is the uh, grand marshal, the, uh, the original parade. Indeed. All right. Besides the excellent, excellent schools, what is special about the Fountain Hills Unified School District? A, B, and C. You got it right. It is E, <laughs> all of the above. Yes, we, uh, we, we are. Uh, I'm very. We're very proud of our school district out here. The um, actual district itself was formed in 1970, so right, pretty much when we got started. And in 1972, McCullough donated 13 school sites. One school we had, everybody there, Fountain Hills Elementary School, kids went to high school in Scottsdale, eventually became four schools. Uh, 1994, we saw our first high school graduation when the school first started. You know, kids that were at Coronado, they wanted to finish up there. So 1994. One of my sisters and I were on the um, what they called the facility advisory committee at the time during uh, the, the growth, you know, when all these people were coming. When I first moved here, we had about 2,400 people in Fountain Hills. And uh, by the time I got off the board, we had 2,400 students. So we had kids that were in trailers, you know, or, you know, those kind of uh, places. We also went through a period of double sessions, which was really tough for the parents and they were either dropping their kids off by the school bus at the dark or they were coming home at, when it was dark. So fortunately the town voters supported us in building the schools and to uh, alleviate those situations. Um, one of one story that's unique, probably unique to Arizona is the state trust land just north of Scott of town. 
um, in an amazing partnership with the state land department and the town, we were able to acquire property for the middle school, which is was pretty much lightning in a bottle. I don't know that it happened too many times before or after. Um, and when I first became a councilwoman in 2006, the town annexed that property, the entire 1300 acres which has yet to be developed. So call me if anybody need anything. <laughs> oh boy. For the rest of the uh, answers, yes, we had a teacher on there, Brian Hughes. Uh, we had other teachers, but he was a district teacher. And then Joey Schwagel was the student who came on. He was very young when he joined the board. He came on right after I left, after I, I served from 94 to 2002, and he came right in there at the time. Um, and as uh, mentioned, we were happy to welcome Fort McDowell, the Yavapai Nation, Myrtle Doka to the board. At the time, uh, it was an unusual thing and we were very proud. Um, she, she was very forward thinking, um, you know, with the casinos and such, there was money to be um, distributed to members there, but she insisted that they graduate from high school. Um, and being our closest neighbors, we were certainly united in wanting the best for our kids and we still are and to this day. We have two A plus schools, um, and that was what I attended yesterday. The Fountain Hills High School achieved that. Um, our district is part of East Valley Institute of Technology, uh, so we have all alternate alternatives for all of our students. Um, we have excellent sports, bands, clubs, etc. It's a school district that's large enough to accommodate these things. Yet um, no one ever feels, you know, lost or just part of this huge crowd. Um, we also have choices for um, charter schools and private schools, of course, and we invite young families to come and check out our excellent schools. Very good. All right. So moving on to question five, which will be interesting to see how many people got this right, <laughs> because it's none of the above. Which of these fast food chain restaurants is not associated with Fountain Hills? Well, and that was a little bit tricky because, you know, it, it, you would probably <laughs> want to say White Castle, but um, that's exactly the one I want to talk about. The others, obviously, we have here and we're very pleased that we have the, them to offer. But um, I want to hone in on that White Castle. Um, the town was about to recognize their 10 year anniversary in 1980. And the celebration committee, just like the celebration committee we just had for our 50th, wanted to come up with a unique and fun way to celebrate. So at one of their meetings, member and who was the chair chair of the chamber at the time, Bruce Rogers, went to get hamburgers at, during the meeting at a local restaurant, the Village Pub. Just happened to be sitting there, two women discussing the best burgers they ever had, White Castle burgers. Uh, Bruce was, <laughs> I'm not commenting on anything. I'm just saying that's, no, that's what exactly. got his attention, you know? I mean, I they're delicious little, little square burgers. So he was from California, so he didn't know anything about that, um, but he could sense and see the interest and the uh, nostalgia connected with it. So he brought back the idea to the committee to set up an event that would feature um, these uh, hamburgers. And for an extra twist, it would be the world's largest takeout order. So the result, <laughs> 9,000, 999 hamburgers and one cheeseburger for himself. That was the first order. And as was hoped, it garnered worldwide publicity. The order grew to first 100,000, then to what was I hear the only, the largest amount that could fit in the truck, 176,000 White Castle burgers. <laughs> our old friends, Wallace and Ladmo with Gerald this time performed at our White Castle days. That's my firefighter son right there and his cousin they are both about the same age. So that's how entrenched we are here. <laughs> uh, the last White Castle Day was in 1986 because the burger started to become available frozen in your local grocery stores. Fast forward now, 2019, White Castle has come to Scottsdale and we have the two biggest fans you can imagine living right here in Fountain Hills. <laughs> so I'm going to read this article from the Times because it's really, uh, really charming. If White Castle were to need ambassadors, Fountain Hills is the first place to look. Not only is the community historically well known to the company, but Fountain Hills is home to a couple who are members of the 2019 Cravers Hall of Fame. The Hall of Famers are not your ordinary fans of White Castle. These folks are serious lovers of the sliders. It's Drew Schmidt and Jamie West. 
There's just quite a story from how they came to love White Castle to how they came to love one another. Schmidt grew up outside of Columbus, Ohio, which is the home of White Castle. So of course he loved the place. And anytime he goes back, he has his White Castle burgers. Uh, Jamie's story is a little more involved. Uh, she grew up in foster homes from the time she was four until she was 13 when she decided she could take better care of herself. So in her presentation, when they went, won, won the uh, Hall of Fame, Jamie West credited White Castle with helping her survive her youth. This is a quote, every time I walked into White Castle, I was greeted warmly. I was offered water freely. I was gifted with as many spare sliders as they could afford to personally give. I was able to feed not only myself, but many others. I always tried to take care of other kids who were younger and those sacks of sliders fed hundreds. Every time you see a hungry kid, I hope you think of me and my story. You truly have no idea the cravers who walk through those doors, no matter how big or small they are. So her speech there was only part of a heartfelt gesture that the couple made to the little hamburger business at the time. They camped out, this is funny, they were on TV all over the place, to be first in line when the newly opened Scottsdale store in October, 2019, and they did so. And that led to their induction into the Hall of Fame where they wore their royal finest. The attention they received and that White Castle garnered resulted in their admission to, like we said, the Hall of Fame. So they went to Ohio and towards the end of their presentation, Schmidt said, we're from Fountain Hills, Arizona. We used to have White Castle days. We would actually order 100,000 at a time. We talked about this with Mayor Ginny and past Mayor Jay Schlum and other townspeople. They decided to do something that hadn't been done, which is presenting a plaque to, uh, to White Castle. Uh, they um, they sent they gave it to the president, and the statement of the plaque recognizes Fountain Hills' uh, role in popular popularizing White Cows Castle. So um, while they were there, um, one of the people that work at White Castle asked Jamie to join him at the dais. And so while she was up there, oblivious, hugging hugging her, there was something else happening at stage right, and she turned around and Drew was there, down on one knee, in his best Irish brogue. Jamie West, would ye marry me? So there was a stunned moment. Of course she said yes. The couple kissed and the audience there gave them in Ohio a standing ovation. So that's a memorable proposal. Jamie and West have been together for 13 years and at press time they hadn't set a date. Well, this was a while ago, so maybe they have, but they promised they would have a huge celebration at Fountain Park and serve. What else? I was, uh, I was White saying, Castle all them. around. Right, exactly. <laughs> So that's our uh, White Castle story, and it's interwoven with our history and love, of course. That is hilarious. <laughs> All right. So Fountain Hills is an arts and cultural center. Which of the exist? And it's E, all of the above. There are so many things you can do out in Fountain Hills. Absolutely. And, you know, this is uh, something that we're really proud of. You, you're showing these great vintage pictures of uh, the buildings and our wonderful fair. Um, the Fountain Hill Civic Association and was uh, the Arts Council. I was the charter member of the Arts Council. We joined the Civic Association and they led the incorporation effort. Um, we have that docent led rock. We have an art catalog with uh, everything from whimsical to wildlife to what has been dubbed Fount Rushmore, which is uh, several presidents all together right at the entrance to Fountain Park. Um, my brother did um, a statue called Mirth and Melancholy, which is a play on the comedy tragedy, uh, which is uh, kind of an homage to my sister, my other sister, which is uh, pretty neat because of her role with the Fountain Hills Theater. Um, my younger sister, has done logos. She was at, at the company that did the Fountain Hills logo. She's now working at a, another cartoon map, which she had done several in the past, which wasn't as challenging as it is now with all of our businesses to put all of these uh, organizations and uh, on the map. So she's working on that now as a fundraiser for the chamber. Um, as you can see the uh, those, those pictures, the theater is now uh, freestanding. We used to just do all our stuff in the, multi-purpose room at the McDowell Mountain School. Um, I found out I was expecting my now 32 year old son playing Mrs. Cratchit and uh, Christmas Carol on that school stage. And now it's so exciting to see that they've become the, the Fountain Hills Theater. 
Um, I mentioned a little bit about some some things that had been filmed here in town, including Waiting to Exhale, which was a, a movie in the 80s, I believe. And in fact, it was filmed right here. Oh my gosh, was it, was it that long ago? I, mean, I think so. <laughs> I have to look it oh, up. No, I, I don't remember, remember that film at all. No, I don't remember. Oh, it. you got to check it out. Um, <laughs> there, there's views. No, I know because that scene with Angela is famous in Fountain Hills. So, oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, Adero, which is a new res resort, just uh, wrapped up some reality show. I don't know what it is. It was a big secret. Oh. And there's a Netflix series expected to start uh, filming here. Um, the River of Time Museum, which is named after Alan Cruikshank. Um, there's a sculpture of uh, Mr. Fountain Hills, Keith McMahon, who is also has passed away, but um, a huge part of our history. Um, and uh, just about a week or so ago, uh, the, the library, and you probably know the Library Association and the museum, they're creating an archive of the history of Fountain Hills, and they were interviewing people who've lived here for more than 30 years. They started it last year, they got through several and had to stop. And so my sisters and I were the first ones that they, when they resumed, and we look forward to seeing those archives and uh, having that be part of Arizona history. Oh, nice. So that's, that's, a, that's that one, we're getting there. Indeed, all right, so question seven. So the fate, the base of the fountain is fashioned after a lily. Yes, it is. So uh, it made its celebrated debut on December 15th, 1970. The idea of building the world's tallest fountain as a centerpiece of this new desert community originated again from C.W. Wood, McCulloch executive who had uh, read about a similar idea in the Phoenix Gazette at the time. They had that, remember, with uh, Jay Brashear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's when Chaparral City became Fountain Hills. <laughs> At uh, nearly a ton and seven feet in length, the nozzle was built in Zurich, Switzerland. This concrete, concrete base was designed in the shape of a lily built by JS Hamill Engineering in Pasadena, California. With all pumps firing, we go up 560 feet in height, which is taller than the Washington Monument. Um, we were the tallest, now I think we're the third tallest. Um, the lake is 30 acres. Our namesake park is 64 acres. And the setting for many activities, of course, gatherings. And we have that pro disc golf uh, tournaments there. The liner was replaced in 2000. And we just completed a thorough planning study to prepare for the next time we uh, need to dispose of 100 million gallons of water. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so uh, we had places to put it back then. We don't now. And of course, all the wildlife, the the um, egrets, and and all of the ducks and the fish and the vegetation that will accompany that error, that effort when it happens, um, hope probably in six or seven years, um, through a partnership with EarthCam. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Well, we set up a, a webcam uh, around March of this year. We've already had a million hits, uh, broadcasting live from Fountain Park. It was a perfect addition uh, to add for our celebration of our golden anniversary. We share our iconic namesake and believe that our town's natural beauty and being able to see the wildlife uh, will captivate all as it has our residents. Um, Webcam, we're in good company. They do uh, landmarks, including Times Square, St. Louis Arch, the DC monuments and the mm. Seattle Space Needle, among others. And just wait till we start ramping up our events. People will be able to see us, uh, visitors from near and far. We'll see our uh, 4th of July fireworks, which we are planning on doing this year. Uh, hot air balloon glow, Oktoberfest, and so much more. And of course, a green fountain next year. <laughs> All right. All right, so which of the following is the sister city of Fountain Hills? Now it's kind of a trick question because well, I mean, the answer is B, Deerdorf, Germany, but there are other sister cities. There are. So um, in 19, I know a lot of cities across the valley do have sister cities. In 1996, Alan Cruikshank asked soon to be Mayor Jerry Miles to consider joining the sister cities organization. It's a program that was started by Dwight Eisenhower in 1956. Um, several honorary consuls, which is sort of like ambassadors, actually live in Fountain Hills, including former Councilman Enrique Melendez from El Salvador. Um, so in, yes, in addition to Deerdorf, we have Zamosk, Poland, 
Casterly, Belgium, and a taco, El Salvador. So, um, yes, those are all pictured there. Um, organizations and school district arrange visits and student exchanges with uh, most of these cities. Uh, we went to a taco several times, uh, not me personally, but um, the people from the town. They traveled and they uh, had humanitarian efforts there. Uh, water, um, building homes, we had students go. It was wonderful to see those slideshows. Um, a taco mayor, Oscar Gomez, has visited Fountain Hills several times. Um, my brother went to El Salvador uh, once on a medical mission. And uh, so we have a very good relationship with, uh, with that, with that community. Um, Canmore, Alberta, Canada, which was on the list, is actually maybe our next town. Uh, we're oh, looking wow. Into. <laughs> and uh, also we'd like to do a town in Italy, which I'm, you know, more than happy to go and check that one out. If, well, if you need, need an assistant to go along with you. Yeah, well, I mean, you know. I mean, yeah, I will happily well. raise my hand as a volunteer. Absolutely. Well, you know, and I'm Italian, so uh, I'll be happy to sample all the food and let you know if it's uh, it, thumbs it, up. <laughs> yes. No, I agree. So the cultural, obviously, the connections, um, the compassion and understanding improve the quality of life for all ages here and in those cities. All right. So how did Filton Hills celebrate Centennial? They did all kinds of things. So it's D, all of the above. Absolutely. I this think was... they did even more than just what's listed there. <laughs> I mean, to just look at, I mean, three That's panels, you look did at that it, yes. little tiny type of all the stuff they did for it's Centennial. Like yeah, it's really hard to see, but it's sort of the, that's the indication, you know, and since one of, I think you said at one of your other shows that one of the first gigs you had was during that Centennial time. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, that was where I got the name. The Hip Historian was during Centennial. Oh, okay. Well, good. Then you you understand how important and, and special that time was for the state of Arizona. Yeah. We actually uh, had this, the, you know, we had to go through the big process, you know, and we had the largest state sanctioned event due to the fact that more than a hundred organizations, groups and volunteered uh, volunteers participated. Um, it's such a big theme in Fountain Hills, frankly, in general, volunteerism, they step up on so many levels. Um, this gives me the opportunity to talk a little bit about that. Um, one big example is our Make a Difference Day. Uh, organizations and schools, churches and the town, police and fire, you name it. We all get together on a Saturday morning in October for a variety of projects from uh, fixing people's mailboxes and clearing yards and washes to painting fences and more. Um, I had mentioned earlier a permanent result of our centennial celebration is Centennial Circle, which features uh, illustrations, plaques of the five C's, which I, as usual, I come up with four, four of them, not always the same four and forget the fifth, but I do, <laughs> I wrote it down, citrus, copper, climate, cattle, and cotton. <laughs> I couldn't get cotton, but I finally thought of it. So they are done beautifully there in that uh, centennial with pavers and uh, it's dotted with pieces of art throughout. Um, along those lines, our 50th anniversary, we have a time capsule that we built uh, that we uh, buried, we just buried there about a week or so ago from the town, which includes a wonderful tribute involving the Pony Express. And I would just love to be able to mention that. I see you got the little yeah, horses there, match knife, folks, and our chocolate bar of, of the of the fountain. So um, the Pony Express comes through town. I'm sure you're really familiar with it, but it comes here in February. Uh, last year, it was just before COVID hit, so um, I had asked elected officials throughout the state to please write us a 50th anniversary letters and congratulations, that type, to be delivered on horseback. Which oh, just, what a oh, nice touch. Really, Look at you, really. Jenny, thinking all the time. Well, you know, and they had, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> they had the uh, postmarks on there. I was able to read some at that day, and then um, we all took turns on council at a future agenda to read from it. It was very touching, and uh, some were funny and historical, and are now a treasured part of forever in our uh, of our golden anniversary in the time capsule. You know, we had so many plans that we had to pay, to postpone or change, and the committee. Uh, that the town had um, and all of our and all of our community really came through uh, this with humor and flexibility. 
one of our last activities we were able to have was a visit from Good Morning Arizona, where they did their uh, Friday field trip here oh, fine. right before everything closed down. So we were able to feature the chocolate shop that makes the fountain, the chocolate bars and veterans and businesses. So it was, it was a privilege to, for them to come. And uh, despite the challenges, it's been a privilege to serve through this um, ch challenging time, to tell you the truth. Indeed. And so now we're on to our very last question, which is all about Fountain Hills is the 17th International Dark Sky Community. What does this mean? Well, all of those things were listed there. It was none of them. <laughs> none of the above. We don't, there are not a lot of uh, rules that uh, will interfere with the operation of a community, but they uh are enough to make us a, a, a wonderful destination. In 2017, in fact, Fountain Hills became the 17th dark sky community in the world. Uh, the only one that's in a metropolitan area. A group of dedicated stargazers here in Fountain Hills saw this through to, to fruition, and now they're focused on building the International Dark Sky Discovery Center. The $20 million science-based project of which 2 million is the town's contribution for the property and associated infrastructure. It's going to be a multifunctional facility, which will have an observatory with the largest telescope in the greater Phoenix area, a hyperspace planetarium, not sure what that is yet, uh, inspiration <laughs> theater, and an immersion zone with interactive and mixed reality learning experiences. We have support from ASU President Michael Crow, Governor Ducey, former astronaut, of course, Senator Mark Kelly, Senator Kirsten Sinema, many congressional, uh, our local uh, congressional members in Arizona, and, and many more. Um, if you go to the website, which of course I didn't write down here, but uh, you can just Google it. You see such gorgeous pictures and a great explanation of the Discovery Center. So dark sky communities, um, those things that you don't have to do, uh, some have asked, oh, does a dark sky association advocate inadequate, inadequate lightning? And of course, no way does a dark sky association advocate for none or inadequate outdoor lighting. Rather, it's smarter lighting that's being advocated, proper shielding, amber color range, and lighting with adaptive controls. So like basically, um, you know, motion detectors or timers. So we can have all of those things we talked about. They asked, will lighting of athletic fields or holiday lighting be discouraged in any way? And absolutely not. Lighting is controlled by timers or used for special events, such as lighting of the fountain, ball fields, holidays is not affected one bit by the town ordinance, nor is it a concern of our Dark Sky Association. We're asked, is it okay for businesses to have electronic message boards, and yes, providing it meets the guidelines of the town's sign ordinance. And I found this interesting, the sign ordinance includes, um, you know, how bright things can be. An important requirement is that a sign not exceed uh, 100 units. I don't know what it means, but it's a measurement of brightness. It's called NITs. A study by ASU found that the brightness, any brightness above that actually causes temporary blindness for drivers. So now the maximum is being adopted by communities across the country, regardless of being dark skies or not. Oh, and last, interesting. Yeah, I thought that was good. You know, you learn things uh, along the way. And last, are there potential economic benefits to preserving our night sky? And of course, uh, recently formed Fountain Hills Astronomy Club already has 400 members and has begun to offer talks viewing nights, and other programs related to astronomy. Along with that, uh, Fountain Hills Library has a telescope loaner pr program. And oh, that's wow. Attractive. Isn't that something? So yeah. you can have attract people from beyond Fountain Hills. And the library is there right by Centennial Circles. You have a beautiful viewing area there. Um, people who prefer dark skies might choose to live in Fountain Hills rather than an uh, overly lit area. Um, there are potential unforeseen economic opportunities, for instance, in Flagstaff, which I didn't know this was the world's the world's first officially designated dark sky community now has dark sky brewing company. So it, it does <laughs> spur those kind of uh, uh, markets there, right? <laughs> and Indeed. last, uh, you know, Fountain Hills, we have restaurants and businesses that could develop unique promotional ideas like that. Uh, resorts such as our new Adero Marriott, which is right in the preserve area in Fountain Hills, are actually featuring 
sky tourism amenities in their advertising and uh so oh, cool. indeed it's yeah it's a it's a wonderful thing that we did and we have our uh, hopes up and a lot of work going into trying to get that dark sky discovery center nice well i always ask people now that we're done with trivia how did they do <laughs> because you know i, I mean it's not necessarily about how well you did but it's more about how much you now know i mean it's like, I mean, I, you know, I become obsessed with Disney in Arizona and didn't realize that there was a connection to with woods from Lake Havasu here wow. in the Valley, which is pretty amazing. It is. And, you know, and I, I think we need to plan an adventure to bone house and then go on a night tour. Oh yeah, we so let's uh, find a time where there's no full moon and it's nice and dark, and uh, we can yeah. go to Bone House, get a lobster roll, and then uh, go do some stargazing. No, that sounds a great idea. So, Jenny, thank you so much for coming on and helping us know more about Fountain Hills. I appreciate you th you asking me again. This is a wonderful opportunity, and I I love your show, and I look forward to your next one. Indeed. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your night. You too. Take care. You too. Oh my gosh. You know, I mean, it's just another kind of notch in the whole Disney in Arizona belt. It's like, I love how like at every tour, every turn, there's like yet another Disney thing did in Arizona. It's like, who knew? So now if you're watching on Facebook, now you know why you should be clicking on that share because look at all the fun stuff we learned. And so now we're moving on to show and tell. So, you know, I have a house full of stuff and it's all got stories attached to it. So tonight we're going to talk about Lula Bells. Ooh, oh, so it doesn't catch the light. There we go. So this is a matchbook from Lula Bells, which was a restaurant out in Scottsdale that opened its doors back in 1953. And that was when... Scottsdale was indeed the West most Western city. And it was kind of a gay nineties theme. They had a two dining areas, one called the garter room, the other one called the Rose room, as well as an old West styled bar. It was decorated with all kinds of period appropriate objects from the California's gold rush. And it was quite the place to hang out. Um, in the 90s, it started, I mean, it started faltering a little bit. Um, it then became a jazz club. An ice cream shop became known as Lula Bell's Mexican Cantina. And here you can see originally what, I mean, this is back in the 50s in Scottsdale, what Lula Bell's looked like. And there's a little color version of it. And you can see the friendly staff there. And there you can see the, the Western bar as well as one of the dining rooms. And so it is now, it is Bell's Nashville Kitchen. The building is still standing. So well worth an adventure out to Scottsdale or just down the street if you're at the Valley Ho or not far from Fountain Hills at all. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, next week, we have my friend Margaret, who's an archaeologist from the Kaibab National Forest with all kinds of amazing stories. So that's going to be really good. So that'll be a super fun show. Now, always remember, if you have any questions, stories, suggestions, please shoot me a note either here in chat or you can do them on Facebook, Instagram, or even email. Please let me know. Now, I always like to give a special shout out to um, Indeed, it is PJ Vader Baron my cocktail advisor who makes sure that I always have an amazing beverage that is so on point. And so we, as we leave you tonight, we're going to hear from Mr. Ho's Orgastrotica with some found film footage from right here in Arizona. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day or night. Oh,